Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing in Grace on this uh, early morning. We had snow last night, and it's, it's kind of snowing this morning, too. It's weird. Anyway, it's good to have you with us. I've got a great topic today. Um, I had a discussion with Richard Murray a while back on prayer, and I've not had a chance to share it yet. And I think today is a great day for this topic. Um, I know as we explore different topics, it it makes and probably adds more questions to what we think it is. Um, we talk about you know, you name it, whatever it is, salvation, uh, end times, uh, you name it. It's It's been a discussion of going deeper in our journey of growing in grace. So I'm hoping this morning's will be really, really good. So I'm watching and listening with you. So comment and uh, I'll try and reply as best I can. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy this one. This is this is this is going to be good. So let's, let's just dive right into a discussion on what prayer is. So here we go. My hand, I'm going to sit on my hand. Don't touch that button. <laughs> got it. I got to push. Got it. Oh my goodness. I got it. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah. There's a couple songs like that. Baby, she's got it. Anyway. <laughs> That's right. Oh my goodness. All right. Let's, let's get into a, a topic that I have been hearing a lot of buzz about. Uh, I've been wanting to do a, a series at my church on it, but it just hasn't happened yet because it seems like other more major concerns, uh, usually words of comfort, words of refocusing during our pandemic, uh, are the necessary reminders that need to be shared among believers because they're getting distracted with a ton of fear, which brings up this topic of prayer um, because people are questioning what is prayer anymore? What's the point of it? If, if God knows, now here's, the, here's the line, if God's controlling everything, why do we need to pray? Um, or if he knows what's going to happen why do we need to pray um and there's i think there's a lot of misconceptions about prayer i just want to do a dip the toe into the into the topic and then go wider another time because this one is about connecting with our with the spirit of christ already in us not trying to connect through a special mantra harry potter chants that uh you know if you say it the right way and then god has to move so I don't know. Have you heard anything about this? Like, have you noticed any conversations or questions about this particular topic? Like prayer should have been easy, you know, Lord's prayer. There you go. Repeat it. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think we almost we have to unlearn it, mm -hmm. you know, because we're taught a form of prayer that's extremely mechanical and extremely lifeless and extremely ritualistic. And I don't have a problem saying that, you know, maybe we begin there. You know, but then it's just like with so many things, the Lord weans us away. He gives us something that will never, uh, we start off in sort of a, you know, like the law. You know, we start off with the law. The law is a tutor to what? To bring us to Christ. You know, but there comes a time when, you, when you've got the thing, when you find Christ, you don't worry. You don't even think in terms of law anymore. And I, I think with prayer, you know, we're taught to recite things. And listen, I, I'm a big believer that confessing good thoughts and confessing good declarations is a good thing to do and it helps grease our neural pathways in some ways but you know that's not that's not prayer not necessarily well what, is, what I, does the word confess mean to you because i've heard other versions of what it means so i'm curious well i've actually written a book on it it was the first book i ever wrote really? it's called lift up your jawbone and the whole thing was on using samson as a type you know he, he, he defeated the philistines by lifting up his jawbone i use that as an allegory to say we defeat the philistines but here we're talking about Philistine ideas, Philistine spirits, not, not flesh and blood. Uh, but just, you know, we lift up our jawbone and, and I, I studied deep into the Jewish culture and, you know, they would recite 300 and still do still recite 312 blessings or 315, whatever it is, blessings a day, you know, and, and which is a good thing. I mean, the, the, you know, the praise God, blessed be the Lord God who causes my bowels to move. 
You know, I mean, every little thing they're thankful for. And of course that can become mechanical and that can become, uh, you know, that can become just a habitual thing to where you're not even, you know, you're not even really engaged in it anymore. But one of the things the Hebrews used to focus on, the mystical part of, of, of Hebraic thought, was something called Kavana. And Kavana, it, it's actually a Yiddish term, uh, but it, it describes the concept of, a, of heart concentration, hmm. uh, of a wholehearted concentration. And the rabbis would teach that, uh, that we, we pray as if God's presence is in front of our face. You know that there's an immediacy to it instead of screaming to try and get to reach them. Exactly, um, and and so it's a it's a, I like to call it uh, I like to call it a heart concentration. It, it's not mental concentration; it's heart concentration mm. to where our hearts are engaged, and we sit here and we focus on the reality of God in front of us, so that we're relating to the presence on that, and then out of that we can make confessions. And uh, I, I've written like five, five chapters. Uh, many chapters in there on just confessions for different aspects of our life, you know, worship and and devotions and for praying for our kids and, you know, praying for work and things like that. Just just that I called out from scripture, but you know, you could do them and you know, you could do them without any Kavana and you just kind of, the time's just kind of passing by. Maybe you're patting yourself on the back. Hey, I did my confessions today. But if you engage your kavana, if you engage your heart concentration, then you actually start interacting with the Lord's presence in it, and you feel the, the tinglings and the promptings of the Spirit. Because this is really what led me to understand prayer to the level that I now uh, understand it somewhat. Because I just said somewhat. You haven't arrived? <laughs> no, I haven't arrived. But uh, w- w- one of the things is, if I were honest, with myself as I was thinking back on when I've interacted with God the most and how I hear him the most, or I feel guided by God, you know, I would have to be honest that it's very seldom, very seldom that I ever do it with English words Hmm. that I ever do with either me speaking them or even me hearing them. You know, now I've gotten words that I believe are from the Lord, but it's very rare. If I were honest, I would say the majority of the, my, my interactions with the Lord is I feel prompting. That's the best word. I feel yeah, divine, in, divine impulses. I feel just the guidance. And then once I feel, once I feel the prompting, then it kind of it floats up into some understanding to where I maybe can put it in a sentence. You know, hey, I'm feeling this. But that, it, it, it's really strange. I mean, if I'm honest with it, it it's just like it's almost like he, he speaks non-verbally. Huh. And, and, um, and, and, prim- and, and actually, I think that he does. I, I think that primarily he speaks non-verbally. There's a language going on in our spirit that we're, we're not, we sometimes we're conscious of it, but, but, but we haven't really given it a lot of thought. Is that like the sound, did, the song, Sound of Silence? Speaking words without speaking yeah. or hear, listening with, or hearing songs without listening. It's like, it's, it's a, I just heard that song today and I thought, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I uh, uh, forget who it was. The guy, uh, I think it was the guy that uh, Calvin killed, <laughs> Servetus. I think it was him. Uh, but uh, use this term. Uh, I may be confusing with someone else, but uh, yeah, use the term divine impulse. And I've used that term myself. So when I saw somebody else use it, I got excited. That's exactly, you know, that, that, that really everything is interpreting the divine impulses. The Lord sends us divine impulses continually throughout the day. Sometimes we're oblivious to them. Sometimes they're subconscious. Sometimes we're paying attention to them. But 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 even that's not the end of the inquiry because once you pay attention to them, then you you've got to you've got to then meditate on them and use you know you honor it you know honor it translate it convey it in a way that honors his nature. You know, there, of course. Sorry. No, no. I was just going to say, but you know, look at a look at the Bible writers. I think they each got divine impulses. But then they they interpreted them. Each of the gospel writers interpreted them in slightly different ways, you know, because they had their own filter. But we could say that they each were hearing the divine impulses. We believe it was God that was that was um, um, inspiring them to write it. But that but that's all that that's not the end of it because he speaks if he speaks in promptings and 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 desires and inklings and insights. Then how we how we might phrase that insight. Well, you know, there could be grammatical errors or there can be tone errors or there yeah. can be, you know, we jump off the rail a little bit with it here and there. But if, if we start giving each other some elbow room to say, hey, my prayer for you is that you would hear God's promptings, his, his 
um, his impulses, his divine impulses working in you and, and, and that you would hear them in your own emotional language at your own level of understanding. And, and we need to see that in each other. You know, that that's, we don't need to be trapped in language. You know, I've, mm. I've said this many times, but I, I really believe that when God uses language, he's slumming. Okay. Mm. I, I think that, that la human language is God slumming. He goes so much deeper than that because when he speaks to us, it's actually stirring our emotions without us even being able to consciously articulate. Mm. You know, it's amazing. Uh, but uh, anyhow, so I, that's what I think prayer is. All that by way of saying that, uh, you know, that, that prayer is just us recognizing and relating to the ongoing presence of God, uh, which occasionally can be verbally, you know, and, and I'm not saying, you know, uh, Romans talks about using groanings, you yeah. know, so some of my most articulate prayers have been times when I've groaned, all right, because I was groaning out of divine impulse. Is it possible know? people are groaning like crazy today and don't even know it? But their yeah. spirit and soul is groaning big time because they're scared. Their their anxiety is shot through the roof for whatever reasons, and there's groaning going on. They don't even know they're praying. Is that is that possible? Absolutely, absolutely. I I, I think for something to be an official prayer, and really, really, when you think about it, I mean, I found the most amazing secret about prayer. I know, I know, but what is it? Is I'm putting a, 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 a it, what is it called? Uh, uh, not a uh, uh, oh, Bill always uses the term uh, when you put a, a lead in for the next thing. I forget what it is. You're setting uh, us up. Yeah, setting us up. Uh, but when, when I studied something about the Lord's Prayer that absolutely, and I, if you want to talk about it now, we can do it now. But I mean, it's, it's the most amazing thing. And it will shock the majority of people that hear this. Everyone I've shared this one has been shocked. It shocked me when I understood. Let, let's hold the thought. Okay. And we're going to come to it before we're finished today. Okay, you bet. Tease. Um, That's the word I was looking for. Tease. tease. Oh, teaser. Great. <laughs> I love teasers. Um, so back to the beginning of this, people are wondering about prayer. They're asking questions. So maybe the definition of prayer is all messed up, or maybe it's been instantly sold as a method instead of a, a, a relationship, um, which brings me to the Lord's Prayer. I don't want to touch yours yet, but... I'm, I have a hunch people are confused. They're, they're told to pray because as soon as they become believers, people, are, we had, had a group this morning, we were talking about that. It's like the, we evangelize, get them to say a prayer, and then right away give them the to-do list of go to church, pray, give money. Like, uh, oh, good. I don't have to think. I'll just do these things. And it's like they're, they're stymieing, holding back the authentic relationship that could have grown from, from just the raw spirit. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I think one of the one of the secrets to this thing is, and this isn't the thing I want to share, but I mean, it's that you know we we actually are supposed to be praying from God mm. instead of to God. All right, uh, because if praying to God makes us. I mean, He's given us the keys of the kingdom. He's given us so many things. He tells us that, he, and even Jesus said, "Pray this way," and 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 that is the tease. All right, when I when I share what the, the what that what he says in the Greek there. All right, go into it. Go. <laughs> well, well, you know, I don't know if you've ever heard of the uh, of the Greek moods. You know, in in any language, there are different moods, and the moods just have to do with what what you're thinking when you use the verb you're using. And if you if you look at the uh, you know, there's four moods in the original Greek. There's indicative, subjunctive, optative, and imperative. But they, but they mean simple things. Um, now, the indicative mood is, is the speaker's opinion of a simple fact. In other words, if, if, I say, if I say that Mike is sick or Mike needs to be healed because I know you're sick or because you're, you look sick, then that's, that's just indicating you know, my opinion about what's happening. Um, then there's the subjunctive mood. And that's, that's the mood, my, my mind toward it, is it might happen. I, I, I would say uh, uh, Mike might get healed. You know, my, God might heal him. That's, it, it's just uh, uh, God might heal Mike if, if, if he repents, <laughs> you know, or if, anything. It's, just my, it's, it's what might happen. There's no certainty to it. And then the optative mood is basically what, what you wish would happen. I wish Mike would get better. So that's my mind towards the verb that I'm using. But... The, the, the last mood is the imperative mood. 
And the, the imperative mood is the mood of command. It is the mood where you are commanding things to conform. And um, it will absolutely stun the listener if they realize how many times in the Gospels, and this isn't any Greek, you know, uh, grammatical, you know, grammatical book about it, a grammar book about it. Jesus continually used the imperative mood. When he said, pray this way, he used the imperative mood. Hmm. And uh, I actually rewrote the Lord's Prayer oh. using that, using the way that it, it, it's actually, uh, you know, if, if we look at, you know, if we look at, uh, uh, yeah, let me reread, uh, you know, uh, your, your name be hallowed on earth as it is in heaven. Actually, what he's saying is your name be hallowed now. <laughs> All right. He's using um, the, er- the eras tense along with the imperative mood which means it is instant, in the moment, complete, commanding it now. Your name be hallowed now. Your kingdom come now. Your will be done as it is in heaven now. Give us this moment our daily bread. Forgive us now once and for all. You forgive us now once and for all. It's almost he's commanding the Father. Now, that, that's a mind-blowing thing. He's commanding the Father. Uh, deliver us from evil now. Father, you deliver us from evil. Now, he's not, he's not commanding evil. It's like he's commanding the Father or he's commanding reality in general. And, um, and what's so amazing about that is that, um, well, let me give an example. Let me give an example of how this would work, how we know how this would work. I want, this is a thought experiment. You know, imagine a boy who knows his father, a nine or 10 year old boy, really knows his dad, worships his dad, knows his dad's knows his dad's character in and out. And all of a sudden the boy's in his bedroom and he notices a strange figure lurking um, at the window about to come in, trying to come in. So the boy shouts up, you know, is the boy, if we use these other Greek moods, is the boy going to say, boy, I sure wish my dad would come here and help me. You know, is he going to say, I think dad might come if he hears what's going on here. Uh, Or if dad were here, I know he would help me. No, that boy's going to shout, dad, help. He's commanding his father to come and help because because he trusts his father and he knows his father's nature. All right. So that is a knowledge of God that, to be honest, a lot of us don't have. All right. So we can't when Jesus said pray in this knowledge or trust. Right. Both. Right. Right. Because they haven't been taught the nature of God. There is so little prayer in the land because there is so little knowledge of his nature. Because once, once we know his nature, then we understand that we're like that little boy in the room. We do know that God is good, and we know that the Father will help us, and we know that the Father wants to, is, 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 he'll be the first one here, you know, but he, he needs, and, and so, but this begets the question, why do we even need to cry out for him? If he knows we're in trouble, why doesn't he just rush on his own? <clears throat> for that, I would go to John Wesley. You know, Wesley said, and this, listen, listen, this is a radical statement, but he said, for some reason, God has chosen not to act on the earth unless he, he operates through the prayers of men. Hmm. Okay. Now, I don't, uh, I think there are different nuances to that, but I think that that's largely true that, and, and we can bring freedom into it as well, because God is non-coercive. He could come in. I mean, if he were a coercive God, he could come in at any moment and zap anything that was coming against us, just make it disappear, you know, but, but yet if he did that, he would be violating our will. He would be violating the, the will of the, I mean, the freedom of the creation, you know? So it's like C.S. Lewis said, for some reason, God, there has to be freedom in order for there to be genuine love because without genuine freedom, there would be no genuine love. So freedom is what oxygenates genuine love, but freedom allows there to be a risk of becoming untethered from the divine will and, and for evil to come and all that. So that's, that's a lot of stuff to get in there, but there are a lot of factors going on here at the same time. Um, but I think when Jesus is praying this way, people have just talked about literally praying what he says instead of praying the way that he prayed. Ouch. <laughs> so, so, you know, but look at these prayers. It's not, I pray that you give me, you know, $150,000. I need $150,000. That's not what's being prayed. What's being prayed is, 
your will be done on earth now. We are submitting. We know his will is good. It's better than we could ask or imagine, Ephesians says. You know, better than we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. You know, but we can't join ourselves with it. We can let, by commanding it, we're, we're yielding to it. It's a commanding that says we're yielding to the Father's will. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you were talking about a charismatic world you've been in. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, people I know in the charismatic world that are, I'd say, overboard, um, and just from my lens, right, or something I'm not used to, they jump on that command thing and they like pounce on it and they sound like they're, they're control freaks and make everybody else feel like crap because you can't, you know, use your power. Come on, God gives the power. Use the power. It's the power. You've got the power now. Call, I claim this. And, and it's like, you're driving me nuts. It doesn't make any sense. How do you reconcile that? Well, because I would say that this type of prayer is a prayer that is for nothing more that it's a prayer of yielding to the Have divine. you seen what I'm talking about? Sure, sure I have. His name okay. and claim it would be the blab and grab it. You know, that, that would be the name of that type of thing. But, but, but that's not this. Okay. All right. This I didn't think so, the, but I just want to, somebody's thinking it. Who's going to hear this? Sure. Sure. Well, you know, I think whenever we start praying for particular, you know, for, for particular outcomes, we're stepping in the way. All right. Mm. I don't know what's supposed to oh, happen. Say, it, say that not again. Even, Slower. When we, when we pray for particular outcomes that we think need to happen, we're stepping in the way of it. And then we're taking over and we're turning what was meant to be spiritual into something soulish and carnal. All right. Wow. And, and that's, that would be, that would be the thing with it because they, they teach you to do it on what you want to happen. It's like these things, you know, the pray for these magic tricks to happen and listen, <laughs> listen, I get it. But you know, some people talk about feathers appearing out of nowhere and 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 gems appearing out of nowhere that's big in the cares man that was big you know and it still is going on to some degree you know around here where i'm at there was a world famous i mean this is world famous i mean you could google it that the, the oil from dalton it was a uh <coughs> a, a person that claimed that the oil was uh, a bible was uh, leaking oil um <laughs> probably from the and, elijah elijah story uh, yeah, yeah. In the Bible, uh, you know, the Bible would be in the vat and in the morning it would be re you'd fill with oil. Uh, well, people were coming from all over the world for this oil because they were in and, and, you know, the owners were claiming and, they, and you know, this isn't a, you know, chemists can't break this down and this sort of thing. And I wasn't buying it to begin with because I just I just wasn't buying it. It just wasn't I wasn't bearing witness with it. And I said, well, why don't if that's it, get the elders in the community. Come camp out around it. Let the elders stay there and watch this overnight. But they would always take it somewhere else so you could never see it. So, you know, I said, well, you know, get, get time-lapse photography. Show it happening. You know, why? I mean, why would God if do it's something? it's real, you should be afraid. Yeah, yeah. why would God do something in the corner and not want anyone to see it? But uh, so sure enough, uh, they found out that he was getting oil from uh, some, far, some tractor place. Uh, and, and, and using it, putting it in there. And, of course, he, he now says, well, it's stopped working for a while and all this. And I, you know, I don't even want to go there. All right. At, the, at this point, but you know, God doesn't do parlor tricks. All right. And, and, and he doesn't, he doesn't want us to, uh, he's moved by love. It's the love. Of, and that's what moved Jesus. He was moved with compassion. When he did miracles, he was moved with compassion and it could have been a wedding. It could have been this. Do you think he prayed ahead of time? All right, father, as I go in, as I, as I go into this, uh, uh, wedding, I've got it all planned out here. I'm going to, I'm going to go in there and I want you to back me up and reproduce the wine and all this. No, man, he went there. He did it in the moment. You know, I mean, even at some point he was even telling his mom, what am I to do with you? You know, I mean, it's like <laughs> he had some sass, but he was so attentive to the father that he was willing to say, Oh, that, okay. <laughs> yes. And then he just, he just was a, a spigot. And that's what Wesley was saying, Mike. I think Wesley was saying, that, that we are spigots. We are his children. We are his agents on the earth. Spigots for his presence to flow through us and out of us. Would it be, safe, for, uh, would it be safe to say then, using the quote from Wesley, because I like the quote, but I can see how it's set off people right away. And they just rip it. Sure. They just wash it off. It's like, wait a minute. If you have um, a one item on your restaurant menu for prayer, and then you add the Wesley quote in, and you won't let it on, uh, you don't have a very good menu 
And there's a much broader, wider way to understand prayer. And when somebody introduces a lens that's going to speak to a certain group of people that are already concocted into a certain way of thinking, it might pull them out. So there's room for even phrases we disagree with. That's funny for me to say, you know, because I, I catch phrases all the time. It's like, oh, I don't like that phrase, that word's wrong, you know, but right. hang on. Maybe there's a little more grace that has to be shown <laughs> to one another. Well, 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 and, and, and I think that, okay, let's assume someone doesn't know the Lord, isn't convinced of the sure. Lord's will, uh, or isn't convinced God is good, or isn't convinced God wants to, wants to be hands-on, hands-in, all-in, hands-on, willing to, to uh, you know, percolate in our thoughts and guide us. And, you know, Romans 8, 13 says, the, son, the children of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. Well, that means something. Being led by the Spirit is prayer, all right? I mean, it's that, that, that's it. It, it's yeah. interacting with the spirit. That's what prayer is. And it can take many forms. Okay. And even when I say the imperative mood, you know, it doesn't even have to be that conscious. It, it, it operates on subconscious, unconscious levels. I believe, you know, we're praying at all times. Our spirits, I believe, are interacting with the Lord's spirit at all times. It's yeah. trying to, it's trying to get our mind attentive enough to the spirit. Imagine to, if that to, happened. If, if we were actually conscious of that. That that'd be amazing. Yes, which which I think is what meditation is when when it says meditate on the things of God, you know, and and uh, you know acknowledge the Lord in all your ways. What is that? It's just saying that. It's just saying the Spirit. Do you not know? Paul said that the Spirit of God lives in you. Mm. You know, so so just recognizing it. But but see, it's like uh, what is it? Jacob's uh, Isaac had to keep going covering the wells. Mm. Uh, because the enemies would come in there and cover over as wells. It's that way with us. You know, the cares of the world and everything else come in and cover our wells up to where our mind isn't even hearing our spirit. It, it isn't even trying to interact with the spirit. Because the second that it, which is the importance of confession. I think, can, you know, if we confess scriptures with Kavana, like I was saying earlier, that can help clear the wells so that we, we can begin the day sensitized to the spirit. You know, and a lot of times we spend all day and we're not sensitized to the spirit until the end of the day. So you know? I'm going to hijack your word, confess again, because we haven't answered sure. the question. At least I haven't heard you talk about it yet. Um, how would you define the word confession? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I'm thinking first, just so I'm not setting you up negatively, because I don't know how you see this word. But a lens that has helped me tremendously in the word confess. Traditionally, I grew up believing that means to tell God all your sins. To confess means admit oh. and beg for forgiveness. That's the kind yeah. of terminology that's, that is associated in the Western church. But I've seen the word confess to rather mean to agree with God. Exactly. Your nature, your forgiveness. You, I confess I am forgiven <laughs> versus begging for something we don't have. That, that's where I see confession as. That's, that's so I'm wondering how you see it. Well, it, it, it literally means to speak out together with, okay. what, you know, to speak at the same time as, which means it has to be two of them, okay. you know? So, so to me, confession is just, you're confessing, you know, Peter says it this way, that we've been given the exceeding great and precious promises of God, that by these, we may become partakers of the divine nature. So to me, the only thing I'm interested in confessing are the exceeding great and precious promises mm -hmm. of God. You know, that, you know, that God loves me, that God is an ever present help in time of need, that if I acknowledge the Lord in all my ways, he'll direct my, he'll direct my paths. But the Bible you know, says that, confess sin. So there's a heavy focus on sin, 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 sin. So those that are sin conscious are only going to hear that and not capture what you've just said. Yes. Well, you know, and, and but if you look at Jewish, Jewish Judaism, Judaism is a big believer in that. Very few of the things, most of their confessions are about confessions of appreciation, that wow. we be intentional, that we be intentional and devotional. When everything goes right, we're, we're, uh, they believe in this thing called tikkun ha'olam, which means repair of the world, that our confession repairs the world, that as we speak through it, we put ourselves in agreement with it. We're inviting God into every situation. We aren't taking the credit for it, though. And that's why the self-will part that's in the, a lot of the charismatic stuff is self-will and it's mechanical. I'm talking about an organic confession where we are in, where, where, when our own, the only thing we're seeking is for, for God's presence to be richly in our senses and in our, in our hearts and that, that we stir our emotions up and stir our sensibilities up to interact with the spirit. That's it. Oh, I'm not praying for anything beyond that. 
You know, I used to pray real specific and very little of what I specifically prayed for would happen. But when I trimmed it back and I stopped praying for specifics and in just wanting to be in Papa's lap, just wanting to be interacting with Abba, then my life changed. I mean, and that, that's when the, the real moment, and then out of that, you know, something will occur to you, you know, and then you say, well, yes, well, yes, I put myself in agreement with that. But it, it's, it, there's no self-willness in it. It all comes from knowing, knowing the nature of God. People can do this without having a big theology about God's goodness. I know I have a big theology about it, but people know this. There are people that know more about God's goodness, less about the theology I know about, but they know more about God's goodness than I do. All right, because they're that way by nature. They're that way by vents. They're that way. So why mess that up? They don't need a theology. They already know it at a gut level. Could it be that ulterior motive is the greatest hindrance to our prayers? Yes. Like yes. You have an agenda. You have your list. My dad taught me to make lists. And then my job, I, this is going to be funny, but then I help God figure it out and how to answer those prayers. Yes. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Which really means it's like this guy with the oil. I don't doubt this guy with the oil probably loved, loved the Lord and thought this was helping him, you know, thought this was helping him. And maybe who's to say something didn't happen at some point? I don't know. It could have. But he took over. And, 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 they, and that, this happens every time. You know, Rick Joyner, I think, was the one that said the greatest enemy to the current move of God is the last move of God. Hmm. All right. And that is because the last move of God eventually it. tries to take it over. They try to take it over, mechanize it, ritualize it, it and, and, and then control it. Reproduce and, it and control it. Uh, exactly. Whereas, whereas those born of the spirit, you don't know where they're coming from and where they're going. It's unpredictable. Which, which means those that are trying to reproduce and control it, um, they are now making them Jesus themselves the Jesus that people have to go to for the salvation they're offering. Exactly. 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 So they, and then their prayers become, <clears throat> it's like Jesus talked about, you, you know, your long and formalistic prayers. You know, we're just praying for the audience. We're not praying to God. You know, we're praying to be heard. I was uh, kind of, uh, I grew up in, in a Baptist church. So my Baptist roots said the Catholics are going to hell and um, uh, that all these other churches are not really sharing the truth. Muslims clearly are evil. Um, that's what I grew up with. And then I hear about the Muslims and their prayers. They pray three times a day, dedicated. Oh, that's so weird. Until I read my own Old Testament, Daniel. Oh, my goodness. Really? He modeled it. He, like, sorry, there's so many more parallels in prayer. And now our friend Safi Kaskas, that's going to speak in the Forgiveness Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm eager to hear what he has to share from his Muslim lens and from the Quran. Um, there are some parallels that we were never told about. And so I see this idea of prayer and the Western church divorcing liturgy and making, like just saying all the icons are terrible. You're praying to Mary, you're all, it's all bad. And yet we have given up um, gateways that helped people approach their yes. mindset and internal uh, concentration. The art in the church did help them focus from the chaos outside the building, but we've lost that. You know, hey, can and we, we judge take, it. Can, I, can yeah. we take about a minute break? Yep. We were at just a second ago, but uh, that's okay. Sometimes we need to take a break. People come to the door and all kinds of stuff happens. So you were on a journey. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to use an example that will blow your mind. I'm ready. <laughs> well, when I was in law school, when I was in law school, I remember when, the, when they were talking about how you define pornography and, you know, the, the, the justice that wrote the opinion on it said something to the uh, effect that, well, I don't know what it is, but uh, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. Yes. And I would, I would submit that that's a good definition to use for prayer too. Wow. There is no all encompassing definition for prayer. Prayer is connection. If I had to put it in the simplest word, it's connecting with God. It's just connection. And uh, that connection could take a thousand different hues, you know, on it. Um, but, um, but you were we, I, I think when we, uh, maybe the highest expression of it is something along the lines of, you know, God hears prayers from us as God prays prayers through us, mm. you know, I that think he's the, the source of the prayers anyway. Yeah, yes. That he's the destination and the source, which really means, and, and, and even that doesn't do it justice because it's just communing. It's prayer is communion and connection. 
with the Lord in whichever form that it takes. It's an organic thing that's actually going on. I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm on tape delay with the Lord. I feel like I catch up with him at, at some point throughout the day, you know, but in terms of the instant in the moment, because of task in the aftermath, I hear stuff, right? You know, I, I have an inkling or a prompting, but you know, there are times when I feel like I'm actually hearing him in the moment. And that's when I, I that's where I want to abide. I mean, that's, yes. You know, that's, that's happening that's, more and more. Like for me, I feel almost guilty. And I have to wonder where's that guilt coming from that I'm not praying like I was taught growing up where you have to go and spend five, 10 minutes, hour a day, whoever's longer is more spiritual. <laughs> and yeah. how early you get in the morning, that's how spiritual you are. But I don't do that. I, as I am going, I am, I am getting awakenings of, of people and pain or joy. And in the, in the instance I, there's a joy that comes to talk to Jesus about something like um, just driving into Waterloo and in uh, depending on the time of day, sometimes the sunset's like, Oh my God, that's beautiful. You did a good job this morning. You know, like just, yeah, just, exactly. just, you know, it's you not know Paul, so... Paul, Paul, Paul says pray without ceasing. How on earth could that possibly be? Now our, our minds, our carnal minds wants to take that. Okay. Well, I got, I got to do 300 prayers a day and got to get out on my knees and, 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 you know, beat the ground or whatever. And that's no more. It doesn't mean that than the man in the moon. It means what you just said. It's but but again, I think that we go through ritual a lot of times to get to a place of organic understanding. Mm. So the ritual is okay. It can be a tutor. Right. right. Exactly. Which, which brings us back to the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. They saw Jesus developing a pattern. They they sensed an intimacy of connection that he had they, they observed it like like they said about pornography i don't know i can't define it, but when i see it i'll know it so they yeah. saw prayer and knew yes. it and wanted in and jesus said you can't handle the truth <laughs> and yeah. so he gives them the lord's prayer and uh, uh it's a beautiful prayer and i hope we can have a good conversation about the lord's prayer sometime you act, uh, do you have yours ready you want to read or did you read the part you wanted to well i was i was just the whole thing was in the imperative mood any Greek scholar okay. will tell you that. But, and so you can understand this isn't something he was asking. Okay. All right. Th this is something he was commanding. And you know, when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was in the imperative. He wasn't asking the Father. Now, you know, I was trying to think of an earthly parallel where we see this, where we see this. And, and we, <laughs> I went to the game show Jeopardy. <laughs> All right. Because, in the, it, it, because the, the way you win Jeopardy, is not because you already know the answer. You know, you have to put it in the form of a question. Mm. All right. You already have the answer. You've got to put it, but you're not saying, well, what is this? You know, it's that. All mm. right. You are ordering the question. Interesting. So I think that there's, there's something there where we're looking for the Lord's will. And by the time we know what to, but by the time we know what to declare it, it's because we see it. It's not because we, we want it. It's not because we're wishing you know, it's not because we think it ought to be that way. It's because we see it. You know, mm -hmm. we see it in the spirit and we put ourselves in agreement with it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of times it's not, you know, it's, it's not specific uh, again, but I, I, I think it is a general acknowledgement of the Lord in the situation and a declaration of his goodness, whatever form that might take, you know, mm -hmm. it, and it might not even take a verbal form. Uh, but I think it's a confidence and it's, it's a peace and a, uh, the past is understanding. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, we carry, we're carriers of the Lord's presence and of his goodness and people, you know, the minute we start trying to, and listen, I can remember the day when I started kicking into, well, I pray this and I pray that we're rebuking this power and this principality. That was all Richard, you know, because I didn't know what to say, yeah. but you know, I, I, I think I finally got to the point where I don't have to say anything. You know, uh, but I do. But my heart is is just to rise or fall to the Lord alone. I, at least my heart is when I'm in a good place. <laughs> yeah. You know, is it, that it, it's to Him. You know, it, it's to Him. You know, we each rise or fall to our own master, and whatever we do it in, in word or deed, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. And I, I think that He often gets left out. The Lord actually gets left out of all this stuff. He gets left out of the rituals. Uh, you know, if, if, if we tend to rely too much on the rituals or the form of the prayer, he gets left out of it. Whereas a lot of times we just need a jump start. Those things help us jump start into, yes. in, in, into prayer. There's nothing uh, wrong with it. But when we start, when we start worshiping the form, you know, and start uh, thinking that's the only way we can do it. I mean, we ought to find a new way to pray every day, mm. you know, 
through song, through writing in a car, like you're saying, that there's something to be heard or declared in prayer every day. And it's just observing. It's just, it's just observing. Hey, I, was part of, I was part of a group prayer today um, by being at a funeral. And there was much sadness, and we were all praying together, grieving together. Was whatever mm. expression coming from our soul, it came out in the form of tears. It came in the form of nodding. And, oh, my goodness, I, I'm, just, I'm just making the connection now that there's a group activity in prayer, just like the Lord's Prayer when he said, um, I pray, Our Father. Who, yes. you know, it, it, there's, there's something communal about that that I actually forgot about, you know. Um, I was, I was, uh, when I started walking in my journey of grace, I was told that, you know, um, the Lord's prayer is before the new covenant, you know, so therefore it's old covenant and that made sense. So I preached it, you know, I see, I was just right. It's not important. But then another wise person, a mutual friend showed that, Hey, hang on. That's, that's too absolutist. Um, when did the new covenant really begin? And what if the new covenant was being spoken into before it even arrived and had already begun, but was still, you know, like there's, there's more to it than just dogmatically writing off texts. And, um, I'm, I'm absolutely. And the Lord's prayer is beautiful. I mean, it's the, the things that it says, especially when we, in the imperative mood, you know, um, uh, I've, I've dropped my glasses here. Let me get these. So I, um, you know, it's like Jesus is commanding, the immediate reality from the knowledge that he has as a father and not, not, not head knowledge, but organic knowledge mm. in the moment. This is my father's will that you don't let evil befall us. You don't let evil befall us, but it, it, it sounds like it's in the imperative because he already knows the answer. That's mm. that goes back to the jeopardy thing. Not because, you know, the boy isn't commanding his dad, you know, not that's not the form of it. He already knows his dad wants to help. And from his dad's point of view, there's nothing that would keep the dad from coming in the room to protect him, all right, to become involved and to help him. He, there's not a shred of doubt in, him, mm. in that. So he's not, he's just stating, he, he's, he's ordering it, but it, it's, from, it's, it's from kind of being on his daddy's shoulders. You know, his dad's walking around with him on his shoulders, and he knows his dad's character. He may not understand it all. He may not ha have all the nuances of it, but he knows his dad is fundamentally good. Yeah. And if we start off from that position in prayer, then who wouldn't? I mean, uh, it's the highlight of my day. My but that direction. wipes out every training book. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's why, that's why uh, you know, if I were going to, you know, if I were going to teach prayer, um, I, I would teach the nature of God first. Yes. You know, um, and, and then just let's, let's learn some things about God. And you listen as we're looking at these things. You listen. What does your spirit tell you? I've had so many people tell me, when, I, when I've taught the goodness of God, they would tell me, God, I knew this. I was looking for this. I knew this had to be the case, I, but I couldn't put it into words. Yeah. You know, it's because there's something in them crying out, crying out, to, you know, to be a spigot of God mm -hmm. and knowing that there's only good that's going to come out of this. And he overcomes evil one way and one way only. And that's with goodness. And, um, and once we're convinced of that, that's why I think that is the fundamental thing. Once you're convinced of God's goodness, then you're lined up we're postured the right way to walk in the spirit. Mm. But if, if we truly think that God is bringing oppression and affliction and sickness our way and smiting us and that sort of can't thing, can't trust him. You can't trust him. And we're double minded in our prayers. There's no way I could pray that, yep. you know, to hear, and to hear Calvinist Calvin's Calvinistic prayers about, you know, if it's your will, you know, smite, you know, smite him. And, and, um, you know, Wesley famous, I think I probably told you this cause I, I tell it all the time, but I mean, Wesley was arguing uh, with these guys that were saying that this particular pastor's uh, uh, child had died drowning, trying to cross a river uh, because of his father's heresy. And uh, that God smote the child as the punishing the father. And Wesley famously looked at these guys, these Calvinists, and said, you know, your God is my Satan. Yeah. You know, and uh, that, that's, why, that's why when I think that Jesus said that he saw you know, Satan fall from the heavens. What he really meant was that, it, that he saw satanic attributes drop from the Lord's image. You know, that, that, that in the Old Testament, like they had falling that, away. The, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. That it fell out of heaven, leaving only a God of light and love, because there is no doubt the Old Testament and the New Testament has a different theodicy. 
you know, that's the justification of God's goodness where evil is. And the Old Testament's clear that God brings both light and dark, both good and evil, that he, that he loves and he smites, that he does both those things. The New Testament comes and says, no, God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And, you know, if there be evil, you know, God doesn't tempt anybody. The Old Testament says God tempts people with evil all the time. James says in James 1, God tempts no one. Let nobody say that he does. Wow. Because only good gifts come from him, from the Father of lights. You know, so maybe, maybe, it's root, maybe it's rooted in too deeply, more than we know, that our false concept of God and um, the unlearning is what's required more than trying to define the word prayer and how it works and manipulate it. Ooh, what's the key? Because yeah. some people come off as if they know the key. And they, for a time, they're experiencing their own little world of positivity, but it bears no fruit. Right. Right, right. Well, and, and, and I think, you know, I've said this before, but it's, it's like a, I, I've come to see that there are certain truths that we, they'll only be rough truths to us. You know, we've talked about this before, you know, that, you know, that pixelated, I've got a yep. picture of pixelated Jesus, you know, where you can't see his face, but you can tell it's him just because of the traditional image we have of it. But um, I, I think that there are certain topics that, that we're never going to get the precise, perfect, you know, 10 point outline where everything covers everything on it. You, we're going to have to be happy with rough answers, but yeah. that's the beauty of it because the rough answer keeps the mystery of it alive. Bingo. Mystery. The Eastern church has embraced mystery. The Western yes. church has divorced science. Yes. And so my goodness, there's, there's wow. much to learn. That? I didn't, I didn't say that. Stuart Johnson um, no, not Stuart. Um, his friend, um, Bruce Walkup, uh, he was mm -hmm. talking about that. And it's just brilliant. That's when I first heard that. I went, wow, that makes a lot of sense. That explains so much. The dualism separation mindset is probably, the, uh, as Baxter Kruger would say, one of the biggest logs damming up the freedom in the Western world to experience God. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think once we, uh, it's like a, I, I use this uh, analogy about being out on a branch. Anytime you start teaching on prayer, all right, you better keep it rough, keep keep it pixelated. The further you go out to saying this is that, this is that, that's yep. exactly what it is, you go further out in the branch and the branch breaks. And it's the same way with so many other things, healing and everything else. Mm. We can know generally. I, I, I believe this with all my heart. That there are certain things we can know in a general sense. And that's all that God wants us. He wants to fill in the specifics on an organic day by day basis mm -hmm. that you can't fit into an outline, you know? And, and, and I think that we so want, we, we, so we actually, if we're honest with ourselves, I think a lot of times we want it all set out in an outline. So we don't have to believe. So we don't Bingo. have to exercise faith. But the whole point of having rough truths and even having scripture that has rough contradictions in it mm -hmm. is because it makes it weans us to the spirit. It weans us away from the opinions of man into hearing the spirit and of being delivered from having to have an absolute precise answer, just a rough answer. You know, it's like the man born blind. Uh, you know, that's misread in John nine. Why was the man born blind? Was it his sin or his parents? Jesus comes along in the Greek and he says, Neither. Nonetheless, let the glory of God be revealed. That's what he says in the Greek. Hmm. So uh, and that's an imperative, uh, so, the way that he says it. So, so what he's saying is he doesn't say what does cause it. He just says it wasn't, it wasn't, that, it wasn't his sin or it wasn't his parents. Sin. You know, he gives a rough answer because if he had to explain what caused it, you know, uh, I think it's Greg Boyd does this thing, the nine second interval where the, where the sun wakes up and, and, uh, he's, you know, a uh, car passes by them on the road. He says, Dad, why did the car pass by at that exact moment? Why not nine seconds earlier? So then Greg started throwing out some ideas why, why he was speeding past them. You know, he was late for work or this or that or the other. And then the boy would say, well, why was that the case? So Greg kept having to trim it back. Go back he'd to bed, to kid. <laughs> yeah, he'd have to know everything. To know one thing, you have to know everything. So yeah. what do we do? We forsake having to know everything. We're not omniscient. We're not capable of being omniscient now. So I don't have to know everything. And that's a deliverance. That's a wonderful deliverance because, you know, I do want to know some things. And I, I think when you, when you, when you, when you accept the roughness that I'll, I just want to know things in a, in the, in, in a rough way and then, and then go from there, you know, then, then I think you're, you're free to be, you're free to hear and you're free to understand because you're delivered of, of, of this 
precision, of having a precise answer. And these churches and these theologies, they, they want, it dies the second you start having to give a precise answer on all these things. Doesn't precision take more energy? Uh, yeah, more carnality too, you know, yeah. but self-will. And that's a, that's a charismatic, to get back to your point, your original point, that begins those things, I want you to specifically pray for this. I'm going to specifically pray for that. Well, listen, if the Lord leads you to specifically pray for it, then you go for it, all right? But I'm just saying uh, most of that stuff is in our own thinking, and it's understandable. We're desperate. Sure, we want to pray for a healing. But what if, what if we in de- instead took a step back and say, my first step in any prayer is I'm going to listen first. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have listening prayer going on first. And I'm only going to say it's something if the Lord gives me something to say, or if I feel prompted, if I feel a divine impulse. And people won't like that. Well, you saying God's not saying anything? No, I'm saying I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I can only, everything Jesus said, it says in John 5, two different places. Everything he did or said, he heard the Father do mm-hmm. or say first. And we're not taught to, we're not taught that. We're not taught that that's how the circuit goes. We're supposed to hear him and then pray. We're not supposed to pray to hear him. We're supposed to hear him and then pray. So we, we would benefit from some Hebrew thought and uh, how they process their thinking and their words, how, the, how they read their scriptures. The Aramaic is important, I think. You know, that's the language Jesus spoke. He didn't speak Greek. So it's funny how we read a Greek translation. Hmm. You know, and, and, and what they say, I remember reading a book uh, uh, by Wilson, uh, last name Wilson. He wrote Our Father Abraham, but he was telling the difference between Hebrew thought and Greek thought. And he says the difference between Greek thought is Greek wants to prove God's existence. Yeah. Hebrews presume it. Okay. All right. They presume his existence and go from there. They don't, they're not trying, they don't have nothing to prove. They presume it. And I love that. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that that's the difference. We're... Our church is largely Greek, and I don't mean ethnic Greek. I mean Western. You know, Correct. that's the difference yep. between Western. I and, totally agree. And we're looking to prove it. You know, everything I say about God, I got to prove to you. Mm. Whereas, really, the fun thing in life is presuming that God is good, and that's why these people, you know, that maybe would hear the goodness. Oops, uh, am I still on there? Nope. Your voice is. Uh, yeah, well, just the people who who would hear the goodness. Uh, Hopefully, okay. you still there? Yep. There you are. Is that me? Okay. Uh, but the people, you know, uh, the people, you know, already know this. I, I, I believe intrinsically, that, they know. Yes, it. intrinsically, and we mess it up. Religion messes it up by yeah. getting you to think the other thing, you know. So it'll preach hell, it'll preach all this other stuff, and then uh, everything gets messed up. But people, when they that's why when, even when I saw the goodness and I started understanding dynamics of the, it was more like I was remembering this than I was discovering. Mm. I knew deep, deep down, I think every person with, with a good and honest heart knows deep, yep. deep down that God is good. And they don't have the answers. But you know what? That We don't need to have it. It's when we have to fabricate the answers. <laughs> I know. Because we have to be more right than the other person. Yeah. 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 Hey, I'm looking at the clock and uh, I got to roll. Okay. This was a really fun conversation. Don't leave that because I got to share something else with you. But uh, thank you for uh, listening in, folks. We're going to continue this conversation at some point. Um, but this is just a one-off for now. Hopefully, it teased you into rethinking what prayer is. Any final thoughts there, Richard? No, you said perfect. All right. Catch you all later. Thank you for taking time to listen today. And uh, and hopefully, you enjoyed this conversation on prayer because it, it kind of jumped all over in different places, um, and definitely there's much more discussion that needs to happen on this uh, theme. I love the topic of prayer. Um, I like how my understanding is expanding. Uh, I, I like that I'm finding a more hope in uh, uh, wider expressions of what prayer can be. Um, yeah, I, I like it. So I guess lo- less dogmatism, more grace. Uh, I'm still learning that too. Um, and if you're part of a particular camp of, of believers and use specific terminology, maybe be a little more mindful of others who may not understand your lingo. I, I'm trying to learn that too, because it's almost like code word. And maybe the code word is exclusive. It's not inclusive at all. It's exclusive completely by shoving out people who don't understand it. 
Uh, we've I've done it. I've done it in the grace community. I've done it in certain circles. It's I didn't realize I was doing it until it happened to me from someone else. And then I began to look and realize, wow. Uh, and, and yet our Heavenly Father is inclusive. And how we communicate with Abba, with Papa, with God, however you want to address your Heavenly Father, um, then pray. And I, I like what Richard said there, that if you feel led to pray for something specific, then great. But let's not make it a, a standard uh, uh, list of, here, you got to do it like this. If, if you need that as a tutor, great. I, know, I grew up with... Um, uh, a small acronym or number of acronyms of how to pray and, you know, begin with, you know, thankfulness and then petition, uh, all that stuff. And they're help. It's helpful for people who have no clue. Um, but it's, it's, it's pablum. It's baby food. It's, it's not the maturing young adult level of, of content. Um, and it's definitely not adult level. So, you know, that, that text in, uh, I think it's First John 2, I speak to you children because you know your sins have been forgiven. I speak to you fathers because you know, him, you know him who has been from the beginning. I speak to you young men or young adults because you've overcome the evil one and so on and so on. That level of, of maturity, uh, we cannot forget that, you know, there are, there are growing pains. There are stages to move beyond. Um, I think... Um, uh, I think of Peter when he got his great awakening, uh, having that food in a in a dream. God dropped down food that was supposedly unclean for Jews, and uh, he learned a big lesson. Then he still continued to unlearn, <laughs> and so are we. So anyway, I hope you guys have a great week. I look forward to our our next conversation next week, and uh, until then, enjoy your week. And hopefully today's conversation was enc was encouraging to you. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.